Hello Flight Simmers and welcome back to Alpha Hotel Flight Simulator Training. Today's lesson will be our second ground school lesson in the VFR or private pilot level training. Today we're going to be in the cockpit of the Cessna 152 doing a cockpit familiarization. We're going to learn about the instruments and aircraft systems on the Cessna 152. We'll do the lesson in the cockpit with the electrics on and with the engine running at idle so all systems will be powered up and we can see how they operate. All right, so the first uh, gauge we're going to take a look at is the outside air temperature gauge. So if we run our head all the way up to the ceiling here and then jam our face into the windshield and then take a turn to the right, we'll see the outside air temperature gauge. It's a pretty straightforward gauge. It reads the air temperature at the altitude you're currently at. The inner scale is in degrees Celsius. The outer scale is in degrees Fahrenheit, although the outer scale is a little bit off. Uh, you can see here like uh, 40 degrees Celsius right now they're saying it's equal to 90 degrees Fahrenheit and that is not correct. 40 degrees Celsius is about 104 degrees Fahrenheit so that's off by about 10 degrees. It's also important to note that uh, this reads the temperature at the altitude you're at and the temperature that you set in your weather window is the temperature at sea level. Uh, so like right now I am in an airfield in Arkansas and I set it to 25 degrees Celsius. It's reading just slightly lower because the field is about 500 feet above sea level. So sea level would be at uh, 25 degrees, but at uh, 500 feet, it's gonna be a little lower than that. If you're up the mountains or you're at altitude, uh, it's gonna be quite a bit colder than that. And uh, another thing to note on this gauge is that if you load from a saved file, it seems to render the gauge inoperative. It uh, pegs the needle at negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Burr. The outside air temperature is hooked to an air vent that brings air from the outside of the airplane inside to help you cool off. Now there's another air vent on the other side of the cabin that's also graphically modeled, but you can't do anything with either of those. They're just graphically modeled. The next uh, instrument we'll take a look at is the magnetic compass, also sometimes called the whiskey compass. This is basically just a magnet that points to north that's mounted in a uh, container full of fluid and the little line there indicates that the current compass heading that the aircraft's nose is pointed to. There's a number of errors that are associated with a magnetic compass when you're doing turns and those are accurately modeled in flight simulator. Uh, we'll talk more about those when we get to instrument training and where you start doing compass turns and things like that. For now, uh, know that it's accurately, mo accurately modeled and that we uh, use it basically to set our heading indicator, although really in Flight Simulator you don't have to do that either. You just use the D key to uh, set your heading indicator to your accurate compass heading. So it's modeled and it works, but we won't be using it a lot. All right, uh, moving down to the main instrument panel. On the top left-hand side of the instrument panel is the marker beacon system. Now marker beacons are used primarily in instrument flight, so we won't really be using them in VFR flight training, but we'll talk a little bit about the system since it's on the aircraft. Marker beacons are radio beacons that are used on an instrument landing system, and uh, if you zoom in real close here, you can see that there are three different colored lights, and they each have a letter on them. Uh, the left one is blue, and the O stands for outer marker and this is typically an ILS where you intercept the glide slope. It's usually about four or five miles from the end of the runway. And uh, as you fly over that marker, you get a blue light coming on uh, and a series of uh, steady long tones. Uh, as you pass over that marker, uh, it tells you that you're at what's called a final approach fix or where you intercept the glide slope. The middle marker is a yellow light and it's an alternating series of short and long tones and that typically comes on about a half a mile from the runway and uh, tells you that you're about 200 feet above the ground on the glide slope which is typically where the minimums are for a standard ILS approach. Uh, the last light is actually a white light even though it doesn't look that white here. Uh, it does have an eye on it. That's for inner marker and that typically comes on at about 100 feet on the glide slope and that's only usually on uh, runways that have a category 2 instrument landing system which you're not going to be flying any category 2 approaches in a 152 it's not equipped for that 
but for some reason has the marker in there. As far as the controls, uh, the volume control is an operative. That doesn't work. Uh, you can dim and brighten the lights there. The test button doesn't work, but all that would do is light up the lights for you. The high and low sensitivity does work, and it's fine to keep it in low sensitivity in this airplane. Uh, that just determines uh, how far away from the beacon you are when the marker comes, when the beacon comes on. And then it has a switch to uh, flip it between whether or not the audio tone comes through the speaker or the headphones, and that is not operative. All right, next up is our airspeed indicator. Let's take a closer look at that. The airspeed indicator indicates speed in knots, or nautical miles per hour. The larger tick marks indicate 10 knot increments, whereas the smaller tick marks indicate 5 knot increments. One nautical mile is equal to 1.15 statute miles. So if you're doing 100 knots, you're doing 115 miles per hour. But if you don't want to do the math, there is a small cutout with a smaller scale that indicates the airspeed in miles per hour on the 152. The airspeed indicator basically measures the pressure the air creates as it strikes the front of the airplane. In flight, the air flows into the pitot tube, the silver tube facing forward under the left wing. It then flows through a connecting tube to the back of the airspeed indicator where it inflates a metal disc. The faster you fly, the more pressure there is and the more the disc is inflated. The disc is connected to the pointer that shows your airspeed. The colors on the airspeed indicator indicate V speeds. V speeds are speeds that are important to aircraft performance or indicate limitations. The green arc indicates the normal operating range of the 152. The low end of the green arc is VS1, the stall speed in a specified configuration. For most airplanes, the specified configuration is the clean configuration with anything that can be extended, such as gear and flaps, retracted. In the 152, this is the stall speed with flaps up. An easy way to remember what VS1 means is to make the 1 an I. VS1 is your stall speed with your stuff in, or retracted. We'll talk more about what a stall is when we get to the lesson on stall recognition and recovery, but for now, we'll define it as the slowest speed the airplane can fly. The high end of the green arc is VNO, or the maximum normal operating speed. The aircraft should only be operated above this speed in smooth air, and then only with caution. Operating above this speed in rough air can result in structural damage. You'll be hard pressed to get a 152 above this speed in level flight. You really have to be in a power on dive to get it above this speed. The white arc indicates the flap operating range. The low end of the white arc is VSO, or the stall speed in the landing configuration, in the case of the 152 with flaps fully extended. An easy way to remember this is that VSO is your stall speed with your stuff out. The high end of the white arc is VFE, or the maximum flap extension or extended speed. Operating above this speed with your flaps extended or extending them above this speed can damage the flaps or the flap motors. The yellow arc indicates the caution range, and again, you should only operate in this range in smooth air. The red radio line is VNE, or the never exceed speed. In a real aircraft, if you exceed this speed, your aircraft is likely to start shedding parts. In flight simulator, you can go above this speed by about 30 knots before you get the dreaded black screen of death. There are several V-speeds not marked on the airspeed indicator. The first we'll talk about is maneuver speed, or VA. It's not marked on the airspeed indicator because it varies by about 10 knots, depending on aircraft weight. The maneuver speed for maximum gross weight, where we'll be operating most of the time, is 104 knots and is placarded just below the airspeed indicator. If you exceed the G-limits of the aircraft when you are at or below maneuver speed, the wing will stall before structural damage can occur. 
Exceeding the G limits above maneuver speed can cause structural damage to the aircraft. The G limits on the 152 are 4.4 positive Gs and negative 1.76 Gs with your flaps up and 3.5 positive Gs and 1.76 negative Gs with the flaps down. Other unmarked airspeeds include VY, which is the best rate of climb. This speed gives you the most amount of altitude gained over a period of time, usually expressed in feet per minute. VY in the 152 is 67 knots and is what we'll use for most normal climb outs. VX is the best angle of climb. This gives you the most amount of altitude gained over a given distance. VX is 55 knots in the 152. We use this speed for short field takeoffs and climb outs over obstacles. VG is best glide speed. With the engine at idle or an operative, this gives you the least amount of altitude lost over a given distance. Before we move on to other flight instruments, let's talk about the types of airspeed we'll encounter. The first is indicated airspeed, or knots indicated airspeed, KIAS. This is simply the airspeed that's read off the airspeed indicator, and it's also a good indicator of the amount of airflow around the aircraft. The second type of speed is calibrated airspeed, or KCAS. This is indicated airspeed corrected for instrument and installation error. These errors are typically small, only a few knots or so, and are not terribly important for a flight simulator. True airspeed is calibrated airspeed corrected for air density. True airspeed for a given indicated airspeed will increase as air density decreases. As altitude increases, your speed through the air will be greater than your indicated airspeed. As air becomes less dense, the aircraft has to fly faster through it to maintain the same amount of airflow around it. This speed can be calculated, but a good rule of thumb is that true airspeed will increase 2% for each 1,000 feet of altitude gained above sea level. In other words, if you're doing 100 knots of indicated airspeed at 10,000 feet, your true airspeed will be 20% faster, or you'll be doing 120 knots of true airspeed. Finally, ground speed is your speed of the aircraft over the ground. This is true airspeed corrected for headwind or tailwind. This can be read off of a GPS or distance measuring or DME equipment. In the center of the instrument panel is the attitude indicator or the artificial horizon. The attitude indicator works on gyroscopic principles, specifically the principle of rigidity in space. This states that if you take a flat metal disc or gyroscope and spin it at a high rate of speed, then mount it so it can move freely, it will stay in its original plane of rotation no matter which way you move whatever it's attached to. So we put a gyroscope in the airplane, orient it to the Earth's horizon, attach it to a picture of the ground and sky, and it can tell us how high or low our nose is and which way and how much our wings are banked. The symbol at the center of the attitude indicator represents the aircraft. The orange dot represents the aircraft's nose, and the orange bars represent the aircraft's wings. The two orange bars at the top of the indicator is a roll pointer. Degrees of bank are marked by the white marks at 0, 10, 20, 30, 60, and 90 degrees of bank. The line running across the center of the attitude indicator represents the Earth's horizon, or zero degrees of aircraft pitch. Aircraft pitch up is marked in 5, 10, 15, and 20 degrees, and aircraft pitch down is marked in 10 and 20 degrees. The knob at the bottom is used to adjust the aircraft symbol up and down, but Flight Simulator boots this up with this well calibrated, so you shouldn't need to use that. When the attitude indicator fails, a small red flag drops down from the left-hand side to indicate its failed state. Air is used to spin the gyroscopes in both the attitude indicator and heading indicator, and an engine-driven vacuum pump is used to supply that air. 
A suction gauge is located between and below the airspeed indicator and attitude indicator. In flight, any reading in the green band indicates adequate air pressure to spin the gyroscopes. When the engine is at idle, the indication may drop slightly below the green band, but should still provide adequate pressure to spin the gyros. Failure of the pump will be indicated by the needle falling to the bottom of the gauge. In flight simulator, this will only happen due to engine failure or shutdown. There is currently not an option to fail only the vacuum system in flight simulator. In between the attitude indicator and the altimeter is our sleek and modern analog clock, complete with sweeping second hand for IFR operations. Flight simulator is going to automatically set this clock to the local time anytime you start a flight, and it automatically changes the clock anytime you change time zones. If you want to change the clock and make it not right for some reason, you can use your mouse wheel over this little knob on the bottom left hand corner. If you just roll your mouse wheel over there, it'll change it by minute. If you click it and then roll it, you can actually change it by hour. You could use this if you wanted to to set Zulu time. To the right of the attitude indicator is the altimeter. It indicates your height in feet above mean sea level, or MSL. The instrument uses a set of sealed aneroid wafers with a set air pressure inside of them. As your airplane climbs, the outside air pressure decreases and the wafers expand. The wafers are connected to the needles to indicate your altitude. The instrument gets its air from the outside of the aircraft through the static port a small port on the left side of the fuselage. This allows the instrument to measure static air, or still air, versus the air that's striking the airplane from the front. The large pointer, when it's pointed to a number, indicates altitudes in hundreds of feet. The small tick marks in between the numbers indicate altitude increments of 20 feet. The small pointer indicates altitudes in thousands of feet. Much like a clock, the large pointer moves quickly whereas the small pointer moves slowly. The pointer with the triangle at the outside of the scale indicates altitudes in tens of thousands of feet. In this particular picture, the altitude indicated is 10,000 feet MSL. This pointer doesn't get a lot of action in the 152. The knob on the bottom left of the altimeter lets you set it to the local altimeter setting. For simplicity and training, I recommend having the pressure in the weather menu set to the standard altimeter setting of 1013 millibars or hectopascals, which is where most of the weather presets have it set. If you use live weather or change it though, you'll need to set your altimeter to the new setting for it to read accurately. To set the altimeter, simply rotate the knob at the bottom left. It has two scales millibars or hectopascals on the left hand side and inches mercury on the right hand side. If you mouse over the knob it will tell you what you've got it set to in inches of mercury. If you set the pressure yourself in the weather you can set the altimeter using the millibar scale to whatever you've set the weather pressure to. If you're using live weather you'll want to try to get an altimeter setting from ATIS or AWOS on the radio or alternatively, you can set your altimeter so that it reads the airport elevation when you're on the ground. The instrument on the bottom left of the instrument panel is the turn coordinator. This is really two instruments in one with a turn indicator on top and a yaw indicator on the bottom. Similar to the attitude indicator, the turn indicator portion of the instrument uses a gyroscope to display bank information. The gyroscope in this instrument is spun with an electric motor, rather than air from the vacuum pump. So if the engine or vacuum pump fails, it will still operate as long as there is electrical power. This is noted at the top of the instrument. If power is lost, a small off flag displays above the right wing. The white bars in the middle of the instrument indicate wings level. The lower set of white bars indicate when the aircraft is banked at an angle that will achieve a standard rate turn. This becomes more important in instrument flying but a standard rate turn means the aircraft will complete a 360 degree turn, or a full circle, in two minutes, which is why the two men is noted at the bottom of the instrument. The yaw indicator, called an inclinometer, shows if the amount of rudder used in a turn is too much or not enough. If adequate rudder is used, the ball stays in the center. 
If not enough rudder is used, the ball will displace towards the direction of the turn. If too much rudder is used, the ball will displace in the opposite direction of the turn. Again, in Flight Simulator, you won't have to worry too much about using rudder and turns, so don't fixate on this part of the instrument too much. The heading indicator, sometimes called the directional gyro, is located on the bottom center of the instrument panel. It uses a gyroscope attached to a compass card to display the compass direction or heading the aircraft's nose is facing or traveling in. The needle at the top of the aircraft symbol indicates the aircraft's current heading and the compass card rotates as the aircraft turns. There are 360 degrees on a compass. The cardinal compass headings of east, south, west, and north are located at 90, 180, 270, and 360 degrees. For clarity, aircraft headings are always read as three digits. So a north heading would be a heading of 360, and an east heading would be read as a heading of 090. The larger marks indicate 10 degree headings, and the smaller marks 5 degree headings. If the needle is pointed to the first large mark, the aircraft is on a heading of 010. If it is pointed to the first small mark, it is on a heading of 005. There are marks on the glass of the instrument that don't rotate as the compass card turns. These indicate what heading is currently on the tail, each wing, and 45 degrees to the left and right of the aircraft's nose and tail. Occasionally, the heading indicator will drift off the correct heading, even if you have gyro drift disabled in Flight Simulator. You can use the knob at the bottom left of the instrument to reset it to the current magnetic compass heading. Just make sure you're in level flight when you do it. Or, in Flight Simulator, you can just press the D key to automatically set it to the correct compass heading. The gyroscope on the instrument is spun using air from the vacuum pump, like the attitude indicator. If vacuum pressure is lost, a small red flag will appear at the top right of the instrument. At the bottom right of the instrument panel is the vertical speed indicator, or VSI. It works in a similar manner to the altimeter, except the discs that expand and contract as air pressure changes have a small calibrated leak in them. The scale of the instrument tells you if you are going up or down in hundreds of feet per minute. To the right of your flight instruments are your displays for Navigation Radio 1 and Navigation Radio 2. We'll be talking about how they work on a future lesson in VOR navigation. So the big hole in the middle of our panel here is where the yoke goes. This is the control that lets you control your ailerons and your elevator. You can toggle the visibility by clicking on the center and making it either appear or disappear. If you're wondering what the red button is on the left hand side here, that's a push to talk switch for your radio to transmit a radio. That does not work in Flight Simulator. It will just make the yoke disappear again. You can make both the left and the right yokes appear or disappear. I recommend having the yoke not visible when you're flying so you have a good clearer uh, view of the instrument panel. However, I'll probably have it visible so you can see what I'm doing with controls during training. All right, so in the center of the panel here, we have our audio panel, our uh, communications and navigations radios, and our transponder. The audio panel on the 152, at least as it's modeled in Flight Sim 2020, is not the best. There's a number of things that don't function, and there's a number of things that don't function well. If you want to use the radios, which we're not gonna do a lot in training, uh, it's better to use the ATC quick menu, which you can pop up uh, with the apostrophe key or with the drop down menu up here that looks like a little control tower icon. Anyway, let's go ahead and step through the buttons and tell about what they do and don't do. EXD is for using the hand microphone, which is this little uh, brown thing right down here, right there, uh, but obviously that doesn't work in Flight Simulator. The one and two buttons are for uh, transmitting either on COM1 or COM2, but they don't work. Uh, you press those, it doesn't change which radio transmits, so it's better to go to the ATC panel and whichever radio you select here is going to be the one that you use. Uh, the gray buttons are for determining what you're going to listen to. Uh, you can listen to your navigation radios. If 
you do both, it should listen to both NAV1 and NAV2. If you select NAV1, it'll uh, let you listen to NAV radio number one. It lets you hear the uh, Morse code identifier off the VOR if you've got one tuned up. NAV2 is for NAV2. AOE button doesn't work, and quite frankly, I don't want, don't know what it means. DME for, is for distance measuring equipment, which we don't have on this aircraft, so you can uh, select it, but it won't really do anything. And MKR is for your marker beacon, so these over here if you're flying an ILS approach. And the speaker button be, can be depressed. That's supposed to switch you between uh, the overhead speaker and your headset, but you know, obviously we don't have headsets or you're defaulting to headsets or something like that, so uh, that doesn't really do anything for you either. All right, so let's talk about the communications radios. Both COM1 and COM2 work the same way. You'll notice there's two frequencies in here. On the left side, you have one that says use, and that is your active frequency that you're using to transmit and receive on. And then the standby is a place where you can basically store a frequency uh, to switch out to it quickly at a later time. A place where you might want to use this is, say if you're talking to approach control on one frequency and you know you're going to be switching the tower soon, you can put it in the standby frequency. And then if you hit the uh, white arrow with or the white button with the arrows there, it flips those two frequencies out and you're transmitting on the one that was in standby. Uh, you can only change the standby frequency, you can't change the one that's actively in use uh, and you use that or you change that by using the uh, knobs down here. The big knob changes out the large frequencies and the uh, small knob changes out uh, the little numbers, the little frequencies. Uh, it does kind of run through these frequencies in a haphazard manner. You notice as I scroll up and down the frequencies there, it kind of skips some here and there. And like if I wanted to dial up the automated weather in Rochester, it's 124.82 uh, and it skips over that frequency. So if you're going to use the radios in Flight Simulator, I recommend that you use the ATC menu. Can you go up to the Equip menus up here and hit the Control Tower icon or you can just hit the apostrophe key and that'll bring it up. Uh, if you do it that way, uh, it is going to uh, say right here, I'm going to tune up Rochester Automated Weather on 124.82. If I select option 1, it's going to dial it directly into your uh, use frequency. It won't use the standby frequency. And another kind of oddity to this is uh, if you dial it up that way, at least with this particular frequency, if you flip it out to the standby and want to change something else, I can change the big numbers, but I cannot change the little numbers, so beware of that. Really, if you're going to use the radios in Flight Simulator, I recommend using the ATC menu to do it. It's a little less frustrating. And like I said, we won't be using the radios a lot in flight training. One more feature on this. Uh, it does have a pull to test. Uh, you make a little click, but it doesn't really do anything. But you can actually uh, bring the volume knob up and down there, and that will actually uh, change the volume on what you're receiving if you're talking to air traffic control or listening to automated weather. Uh, and if you turn it all the way to the left and click it, it will turn the radio off. So if you need to load shed because you've lost your alternator, uh, one way to load shed and reduce your electrical load is to turn your radios off. Also the uh, pull for the 25 kilohertz button, you get a little click and a small animation, but it doesn't really change the way the radio operates. The tuning portion of the VOR radios much, works much the same as the COM radios. Just use the uh, standby frequency to dial in what you want and uh, then swap the frequency over. There is no ATC menu for this, so you do have to do it on this panel. And then if you want to listen to the Morse code, you can uh, hit the NAV1 switch and that'll tune that in and you can listen to the identifier. Uh, just be careful, once you turn it on, there doesn't seem to be a way on this audio panel to turn it back off. And in the bottom of the audio panel area is the transponder. This is what lets uh, air traffic control uh, see you. It actually gives them the code that you have dialed in here and lets you know some information about your aircraft and they can put more in through a computer. Uh, you've got a mode selector over here. It's got uh, an off mode which completely depowers the instrument. Standby puts power to the instrument but doesn't uh, let it transmit or receive. If you turn it on, that lets air traffic control uh, see your code, but not your altitude. If you turn it to ALT, that is the altitude reporting of the mode C function, and that will let uh, ATC see both your code that you put in here 
and your uh, altitude reporting from the transponder. It actually has its own separate uh, altimeter in the, in the transponder that will report the altitude to ATC. The test function in the simulator basically just turns the light. That should be spring-loaded and spring back to alt, but it doesn't, so you have to turn it back to alt. And the ident is that it pops up a ID tag on the air traffic controller's screen. For the purposes of flight simulator, uh, basically if you want to have air traffic control services, you need to have it on on or out. Uh, if you don't and try to use ATC services, they will gripe at you and tell you to turn it on. Uh, 1200 is your uh, VFR code. Uh, so if you're flying just around VFR, that's the code that you're supposed to have in the transponder. And uh, if you talk to ATC, they'll give you a code, and you can either dial it in manually. These just dial left and right, go from zero to seven, uh, and uh, or you have an option. I, I believe it actually just puts it in automatically if they give you a code. The po code will automatically pop in there. Okay, over on the uh, far right-hand side of the panel, we have the engine tachometer that indicates engine RPMs in uh, hundreds of RPMs, so you've got 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500. You've got a red line at 2,700. Uh, honestly, in a 152, you're going to overstress the aircraft before you get past that point. Uh, normal full power is about 2,500. You should get close to 2,400 on the ground, but uh, Flight Simulator underdoes that a little bit, so you only get about 2,300, and then as the air starts moving through the propeller as you go forward, it'll gradually get up to about 2,500, so that's not quite accurate there. Uh, the green arc indicates kind of your normal operating range. Um, when you're below the green arc, because we have a carburetor in this airplane, you could be susceptible to carburetor icing, so we'll talk more about that when we get to the carburetor heat control and whether or not you want to use that in your flight simulator experience. It also has a uh, hour meter that tells you how long you've been running the engine cumulatively uh, in flight simulator. There's also a Hobbs meter just below the tachometer, and this again tells you how much time the engine has been running. Um, this is what they use at flight schools to determine your, your flight time for a particular flight and how much to charge you for the rental. Uh, you can do that in Flight Simulator 2 if you want to. Uh, just take the time when you finish and, and subtract the time it was when you started, and that'll give you the total flight time uh, for your flight but uh, Flight Simulator also does that automatically. It auto automatically keeps a logbook in your profile section. So really you don't have to do that, but it's in, in the airplane, so they put it in here. To the right of the tachometer, you have your automatic direction finder uh, display, and this is for the automatic direction finder down here. Uh, ADFs track non-directional beacons, or NDBs. These are becoming pretty rare in aviation nowadays with the proliferation of GPS. It's a pretty simple system. You tune in the station, make sure it's uh, set to ADF, and then the needle, if you're in range, will point whichever direction you need to go uh, to fly to that station. Uh, you can line this up with your heading so that you know which magnetic heading you need to take up to get to that station. Uh, but like I said, most of the uh, stations are being decommissioned nowadays, so it is hard to find those. Uh, we'll probably do a supplemental lesson for instrument training on using uh, ADFs and NDBs. Uh, but for now, most pilots just use these to listen to AM radio stations on long cross countries. So up on the top right corner of the panel is the amp meter. This is basically a gauge that shows you the charging status of your battery and right now in flight simulator this does not function properly it actually works a little backwards uh, normally the way it should work is if your battery is neither charging nor discharging if the alternator is providing the electrical load for the airplane uh, it should show a zero so right now that's what it should show it should show this negative whenever the alternator is not working or isn't providing enough power uh, so the battery is having to give some juice for some of the components, it'll show a negative, meaning the battery is uh, discharging. It's sending out uh, more energy than it's getting. And then it'll swing over to the positive side. If you turn the battery on uh, first before you get the engine started and the alternator running, uh, if you drain the battery a little bit uh, with start or running your electrical components on the battery itself, uh, and then start the engine, get the alternator going, uh, when it charges the battery, it'll go over to that 
po positive side there. Uh, like I said, right now that doesn't function correctly in flight simulator. It's a little bit backwards. Uh, you should also get a low voltage light coming on anytime the battery is uh, discharging with the alternator running, and we're not currently getting that. There is a mod out there for the 152 that does fix uh, a number of the systems on the 152, including the amp meter and the audio panel. Uh, I think it also updates some aerodynamics. Uh, so if that's something you're interested in, you can find that on flightslakeflightsim.com uh, and places like that. Um, and hopefully, Flight Simulator gets around to uh, actually getting the systems back to working order um, sometime in the near future. Okay, looking at the bottom left-hand side of the panel, right here we have our parking brake control. And when it is out like this, that means your parking brake is set. And if you click on it, it will release the parking brake. So now the brakes are not on. And you'll notice whenever we put the parking brake on, the tops of the pedals deflect. Those are your brakes on the tops of the pedals. So if you push the tops of the pedals, you're actuating your brakes. In the real airplane, to set the parking brake, you have to, set, you have to step on the brakes and then pull the parking brake handle to get the brake set but this just animates the uh, brakes going forward too. You can also see that whenever you do the toggle brakes, you'll see the uh, pedals go forward. Again, I recommend uh, hooking this up to uh, a key on your keyboard or on your joystick so you have a quick access button to get the parking brake on and off. To the right of your parking brake control are the fuel quantity gauges. Uh, it says you have 18 gallons and 100 pounds in each tank. It reads in uh, gallons and pounds, neither of which is accurate. You actually only have 13 gallons uh, in each tank, so 26 total gallons, and uh, it said that's about 84 pounds in each tank. Of that uh, 26 gallons, only about uh, 24 and a half of that is actually usable. Uh, the rest of it can't drain out of the tanks. The tanks are located uh, in the wings, underneath the fuel caps obviously, so that's where they are, and because they are above the engine, they actually gravity feed to the engine and you don't need a fuel pump on this airplane. If you want accurate looks at what your fuel looks like, go up to your fuel quick menu here, and uh, that will bring up what you have in each uh, tank. As you can see, we've got just shy of 14 gallons in each tank, and you can also express that in pounds. This is your uh, not only your fuel, but your weight and balance display. And we'll talk more about that when we do our first actual flight. To the right of the fuel gauges are your oil gauges. You have one for oil temperature and one for oil pressure. Uh, they've gone to a pretty simple philosophy with gauges on an airplane. Green is good. If it's in the green, you're good. Uh, if it's in the red, that's bad. And you'll need to take some action on that. Uh, with the oil pressure gauge, you do have a space between uh, the green indication, the normal indication, and the red line for the low, it, low oil pressure. Uh, that's normal when you're on the ground and when you're at idle, but as you bring the engine RPM up, that should go into the green band. So again, bottom left, you have a uh, primer, an engine primer, and you use this for, before you start the engine, sometimes you need to shoot a little fuel into the cylinders to get them to light off when they turn. Uh, just clicking on it pulls it out and pushes it back in which sucks fuel into the primer and then shoots it in, into the engine cylinders. Uh, a note on starting on this airplane, if you even if you do all the correct procedures I have found that it does not start if you use manual procedures uh, but if you do control E that will do an automatic start and it should start right up. I think that's a simism. Uh, I seem to have followed all the correct procedures and it just sits there and cranks whereas if you do control E, uh, it'll start right up for you. To the right of the primer is the master switch. It is a two-sided switch with the left side controlling the alternator and the right side controlling the battery. The alternator is turned by the engine and generates the electricity used to power most of the aircraft's electrical components. These include the engine starter, lights, radios, engine gauges, pitot heat, turn coordinator, and flat motors. It can also charge the battery if it has been drained by powering electrics prior to engine start and starting the engine. With a switch in the up or on position, the alternator is connected to the electrical system to power all components. When the switch is in the down or off position, the alternator is disconnected from the system and the battery provides power to the electrical components. 
When the battery side of the switch is on, it connects the battery to the electrical system. If the alternator is failed, switched off, or the engine is not running, the battery will provide electricity to any powered electrical components. If you minimize the load by turning off non-essential electrical components, the battery will provide power for approximately 30 minutes. When this side of the switch is turned off, it will depower the entire electrical system regardless of the state of the alternator. You can see when I did that, the fuel gauge is turned off, the engine gauge is turned off, turn coordinator turned off, and if you looked at the outside of the airplane, the lights would now be off. Normally both sides of the switch are turned on prior to engine start or to use electrical components prior to start, and the switch is turned off after shutdown. To the right of the master, you have the ignition switch or the magneto switch. Uh, magnetos are little electrical power sources. Uh, they are basically like mini alternators that just provide spark to the spark plugs in the engine. So that if you lose your alternator or your battery, you will still have your engine running. There are two of them, and they each power one spark plug on each cylinder. And that way, if one fails, you have the other one still providing power, and your engine will still run. Uh, there's different positions on here. Off will turn the magnetos all the way off. That'll make your engine cut off. That's not recommended. That's not a good way to shut down your engine because there'll still be fuel in the cylinders if you do it that way. You can power just the right magneto, just the left magneto, or the normal position is both. And then the start position is what you use to start the engine and it's spring-loaded. If you uh, twist the key over to the start position and then let go, it's going to snap back uh, to the both position. You'll use that mainly on uh, magneto checks, and again, we'll talk about that if we do a lesson on ground procedures, but the normal position for that switch is to both. The little silver knob to the right of the magneto switch is a glare shield brightness adjustment. Um, I think this is for backlights on the instrument, but those don't appear to have been installed on this aircraft. Uh, so really, you're just kind of spending that for fun, apparently. So the right of the glare shield adjustment knob that doesn't work is a row of switches. Most of these are light switches with the exception of the pitot heat switch. This turns on a heater for the pitot tube. It's good operational procedure to have that on. It clears moisture out of there and uh, it's generally most people just keep it on most of the time. You can turn it off if you want to reduce electrical load if you have an electrical failure or something like that. You don't have to have it on unless you're going into icing conditions, which we won't be doing in uh, VFR training, but like I said, it's a good operational procedure to have that on. The rest of these are light switches. Uh, the dome light controls a red light that is up on the ceiling, and with the glare shield lights not being installed, that's the only way to really see your instruments at night at all. So really you'll want to use that for uh, night lighting, or mood lighting if you want. The nav lights are the lights on your wing. You have a green light on the right wing, you have a red light on the left wing, and then a white light on the tail. And again, it's a good idea to just have these positioned on so that when you turn the master on, they automatically come on, unless you're trying to conserve power for some reason. The strobe lights are also located on the wing tips. You have one on each wing, and that's a white strobe light uh, that if you turn that on, it's a good idea to turn that on for takeoff and landing and any time you're close to an airport. The beacon is also called the anti-collision light. That's located on the top of your tail, sometimes called a rotating beacon. Even though most of them don't rotate anymore, they just flash. Uh, but that is the light that you want to have on any time your engine is running. You want to turn it on before you start your engine, and then you want to turn it off after you've shut down your engine. Uh, the taxi and landing lights are both located in the nose. Flight Simulator doesn't model them so that they look like they are different lights or different filaments, but they're the lights that are up in your nose, and you want to turn those on again for takeoff or for landing. Really, it's a good idea to do that anytime, uh, day or night, when you're uh, taking off or landing or in the vicinity of an airport, uh, just to increase your visibility. To the right of our light switches, we have the elevator trim position indicator and the elevator trim wheel. The way the trim wheel works is if we rotate the wheel backwards, 
or down as we're viewing it from the behind here. Uh, that rotates the nose up, and as we rotate it forward, it rotates the nose down. The way I like to think of it is think of sticking the airplane kind of on the side of this wheel here with the tail sticking out the back. If I pull the wheel down like this, the tail is going to go down and the nose is going to go up. And if I push the wheel forward like this, the tail is going to go up and the nose is going to go down. And you can see whichever way I went, move that, the uh, indicator also moves in the same direction. I do recommend binding uh, elevator trim up and down to joystick controls, especially if you have a couple of buttons on the top of your joystick, then it functions basically uh, like an electric trim, an aircraft that have an electric trim, which is really handy. Alright, so to the right of our oil temp and oil pressure gauges are our engine controls. The control on the far left is the carburetor heat. You pull this out to turn the carburetor heat on and push it in uh, to turn the carburetor heat off. The engine on the 152 has a carburetor that's used to draw fuel into the engine instead of fuel injection like most modern airplanes and cars. The carburetor is basically a tube that creates low pressure to draw fuel into the engine and it creates that low pressure in a similar way to the way the wing creates lift. When the pressure of the air drops to draw the fuel out, the temperature also drops so ice can be formed if there's enough moisture in the air even if the outside temperature is relatively warm. If ice forms in the carburetor, it can block the flow of air and fuel into the engine, which can cause a loss of power. To counter that, you use carburetor heat to prevent ice formation. Good operational practice is to pull the carburetor heat on in flight anytime you operate the engine at RPMs that are below the green arc. Because it's forcing much warmer air through the carburetor, which is less dense, you'll get a slight drop in engine RPMs when you pull the carb heat on. If you don't have icing formation turned on the option menus, I don't think you'll get carburetor ice. I don't even know that you'll get carburetor ice if you have the icing turned on. Uh, so if you have the icing turned off, you can for sure just pretend you're flying a fuel injected in engine and ignore the carb heat. It's up to you and how operationally realistic you want your 152 uh, flying experience to be and if you want to mess with the carburetor heat or not. To the right of the carburetor heat is the throttle. This is a pretty straightforward control. If you push it in, it increases engine power, and if you pull it back, it uh, decreases engine power as denoted by RPMs. Uh, on the real airplane, on a real 152 or any other piston airplane for that matter, you have to be careful how quickly you push the throttle in. If you shove it in very quickly like that, uh, you'll actually kind of flood the engine with too much fuel and that will actually stop combustion. Uh, but as you can see in flight simulator, it really doesn't matter. You can push it backwards and forwards as fast as you want and the engine will be just fine. So again, we'll talk about how to do it correctly, but it doesn't really matter in flight simulator how you do it. To the right of the throttle, the red control is the mixture control. Uh, this controls how much fuel goes into the fuel-air mixture. Uh, as you climb up in altitude and the air gets less dense, you don't want your air oversaturated with fuel. That causes a loss of power. Uh, so you can lean out the mixture, pull that back to reduce the amount of fuel that's in that fuel-air mixture and get uh, normal power up to a certain altitude. Uh, right now I recommend that you have the auto lean option turned on uh, for training. Uh, I will have you turn that off uh, once we get into cross-country training and navigation uh, and learn how that control works a little bit better. But for right now I recommend having the auto lean on and then you just don't have to worry about that right now. We'll talk about that a little bit later. To the right of the mixture control is the flap control. Uh, you'll notice it has a position indicator on the left hand side that's actually mechanically connected to the flaps to indicate what the position the flaps are in from zero down to 30 degrees. And then the control or the flap handle or flap switch is the black uh, handle or switch that's shaped like a wing. That's shaped like a wing so that if you're uh, grabbing for a control in a dark cockpit and you come across one that is shaped like a wing, you know that you have the flap handle. Manufacturers do the same sort of thing with uh, gear handles on aircraft that have retractable gear, except those are shaped like wheels. You'll notice it also has uh, detents at uh, 10 degrees and 20 degrees with a stop at 30 degrees and that's so that you can put them down in uh, 10 degree increments and then you see the uh, flap indicator also moves 
as the flaps move so you can tell what position the flaps are in. To the right of the flap handle you have a cabin air controller and a cabin heat controller. In the real airplane when you pull the cabin air it opens some vents to allow a little more airflow into the cabin and help you cool down a little bit. The cabin heater actually runs air over the exhaust manifold to heat it up before it goes into the cabin to provide you with some heat. In Flight Simulator these are both uh, dummy controls. You can actuate them but they don't actually operate a system. They don't do anything. They don't affect the way the airplane is going to fly or anything about the way the aircraft operates. They're just basically there for show, but you can actuate them. Over under the right hand side of the panel here, uh, you have some more, con not controls, but things that are just modeled. You have some more circuit breakers. An on off switch that doesn't do anything, and I honestly don't know what it's for. This looks like an external power receptacle, and then this is uh, plug-ins for a headset, which obviously we can't use in Flight Simulator. Let's take a look at the rudder and the brake pedals, just so you can see how those operate. Uh, right now I've got the parking brake on, so the toes of the pedals are deflected, depressed forward. If I take the parking brake off, you can see they rotate back, and if we just deflect or toggle the toe brakes, the same thing happens. They uh, go forward, so that's how you actuate the brakes on the real 152. You would actually have your uh, your heels on the bottom and your toes on the top to do the brakes. You rotate your feet forward, but then to actually steer the rudders, you push your heels left and right. So that's how rudder pedals work. The last control we'll take a look at is the fuel shutoff valve, which is down here on the floor between the two seats. We'll get kind of our head on the floor here and take a better look at that. When the fuel valve is uh, parallel to the floor like this, it is open, which allows fuel to go from the tanks into the engine. If you uh, bring it up perpendicular to the floor, that shuts the valve off. I believe the valve is in the wing, so you're shutting it off at the source, and that shuts off fuel to the engine. As you can hear, the engine just died when I did that. Uh, so the only reason you'd ever want to do this is if you've had an engine failure and you're having an off airport landing, the checklist directs you to move this valve to shut off, or if you're on fire. Uh, obviously, feeding fire fuel is not a good idea, uh, so to shut it off, you can shut that off there. Uh, again, only as directed by the checklist. If you're interested in learning more about the 152 or doing a deep, deeper dive into the systems or performance or procedures, it's fairly easy to find a Cessna 152 uh, information manual, which is basically the pilot operating handbook, but not for a specific airframe. If you search for it on the internet, there's a number that are out there and available for free. All right, so that should give you a good overview of the instruments and systems on the Cessna 152. I think we're ready to go take it flying now. The next lesson, our first flight lesson, will focus on a normal takeoff and the four basics of flight. Looking forward to seeing you then.